We're going to be talking about screening in the older patient and ways to rapidly screen the older patient to find out if they're at risk for going on to developing disability or being hospitalized. Recently, Medicare has developed an annual wellness visit. This visit requires a health risk assessment followed by a provider consultation and a personalized prevention plan. At St. Louis University, in an attempt to make this annual wellness visit easy to do, we have developed five screening tests. These are a screening test for frailty, one for sarcopenia, one for cognition, and one for stress. Frailty is defined as occurring when under stressful conditions the person has diminished ability to carry out important practice social activities of daily living. It should be distinguished from disability. As you look at this uh, graph here, you can see that most of us peak somewhere around 30 years of age, and then a variety of parts of our body function tend to deteriorate at a rate of about 1% per year. We find that cognitive function, VO2 max, cardiac output, balance, and muscle strength all deteriorate at this 1% per year. We can slow this down by doing exercise, but in addition to that, we can find that if we get a disease, this will push us down at a greater rate. Therefore, we will reach at some stage a frailty threshold at, after which we are at much increased risk of going on to developing disorders. The frailty cascade has really three components, the psychological, the social, and the biological. The psychological consists of depression, cognition, anxiety, fear of falling, fatigue, and health perception. The social consists of environmental problems, income, support systems, health literacy, and activity. And the biological, genetics, muscle, hormones, cytokines, disease, and a variety of deficits that we may develop over our lifetime. All of these conspire together to produce frailty. People who are frail have an increased risk of going on to developing a functional deficit, either instrumental activities of daily living or basic activities of daily living. Those people are at a much higher risk then of going to being hospitalized and or finishing up in a nursing home and eventually. So the frailty screen consists of five different questions. This is fatigue, are you fatigued? Resistance, can you climb one flight of stairs? Aerobic, can you walk one block? Illness, do you have more than five illnesses? And loss of weight, greater than 5% in six months. This has eight different validations around the world, including in the United States, and is scored by, if you have one or two of these as positive, you're considered pre-frail, and three or more are your frail. We have shown in St. Louis that people who have screened as either pre-frail or frail have much higher percentage chances of developing a deficit in basic activities of daily living or in mortality. As you can see here, the frail scale works as well as other better known scales that take much longer to do, such as uh, the sc scale of the osteoporosis uh, foundation, the CHS scale, also known as the Freed scale, and the Rock scale. Uh, the specificity of these scales was looked at in detail in Hong Kong, and it turns out that the frail scale is at least as specific for mortality and physical limitation as any of the others. All of these scales have less good sensitivity compared to When we look at the screen for uh, sarcopenia, this is the SARC-F, its strength. How much difficulty do you have in lifting and carrying 10 pounds? The scoring is either none, which would be zero, some one, or a lot or unable, two. Assistance in walking, how much difficulty do you have walking across a room? None is zero again, some one, and a lot or use aids or unable is two. Rise from a chair, how much difficulty do you have transferring from a chair or bed? Again, not one or two. Climb stairs, how much difficulty you have climbing a flight of 10 stairs, either, again, the scoring is the same with a naught one or two. How many times have you fallen in the last year for the falls uh, screen? None, again, zero. One to three falls would be one, and four more falls would be two. If your score is higher than four, you are going to be classified as having a 
This has been validated in St. Louis, showing you here a marked increase in odds ratio over six years if you are SARC-F positive with a odds ratio of nearly 4.5 for a deficit in basic activities of daily living, odds ratios between 2 to 2.5 of deficits in uh, uh, instrumental activities of daily living or hospitalization at slowed gait speed and for mortality an odds ratio of one point. Uh, similarly, the SARC-F was uh, uh, validated in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study, and here again, people with a SARC-F of 4 or greater are much more likely to have ADL deficits, instrumental ADL deficits, deficits in their grip strength. Also, they go on to develop slower grip strength, uh, 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 gait speed, and more likely to, be, uh, uh, to die. The odds ratio for your for your outcomes was looked at in uh, Hong Kong, comparing it to the other major measurements for sarcopenia. These include the foundation of NIH uh, uh, sarcopenia uh, scale, the European Working Party sarcopenia scale, the International Working Group sarcopenia scale, and the Asian Working Group sarcopenia scale against the SARC-F. And what you can see here is both in males and females that the SARC-F tends to predict physical limitation, problems with chair stand and walking speed better than some of these more complex. Now we move on to cognition, and we need to recognize that both families and physicians often fail to recognize dementia. Uh, in family practice, at least 25% of people with dementia are not recognized by family physicians. To overcome this, it's necessary to use screening tests for cognition. The classical screening test has been used as the mini mental status examination of Falstein. It is a relatively simple test. It takes about 10 minutes to do. It is educationally dependent with both false positives and false neg negatives and has minimal testing of visual spatial system. Importantly, it does very poorly at picking up mild cognitive impairment and really is a test for dementia rather than early cognitive impairment. This we developed a uh, scale called the St. Louis University Mental Status Scale to try and look for mild cognitive impairment. And as you can see here, looking at the receiver operating curve, the St. Louis University Mental Status uh, uh, screen works much better than uh, the mini mental status. And here you see the screen. Uh, the major components of the screen are the five words that you have to be able to remember, the clock test, and then the chest of executive function, which is a paragraph, after which there are four questions based on the paragraph. Uh, this, as we said, is well validated, as also is the Montreal uh, Cognitive Assessment Scale. Uh, the St. Louis University Mental Status Exam takes about six and a half minutes to do. The uh, marker takes about 10 minutes to do. When we compared these screening tests for MCI, it turns out that they work very similarly with a similar sense specificity. Uh, because these tests take too long to do in a screening situation, we went ahead and developed a rapid screening test at St. Louis University. This consists of the five words, and once the words are learned, the person is asked to draw a clock and place the uh, the hour hand, uh, the hours on the clock from 12, 1, 2, all the way around, and then in addition to that, to put in the time at 10 to 11. They are then asked to remember the five objects that they were uh, taught before, and then finally a paragraph is read to them, and they are asked to be able to say what state the person lives in, having been told the person lives here. This test has excellent receiver operating curve for dementia and very similar to the mini card and high sense specificity. It also has very good receiver operating curves for the mild cognitive impairment. And here again, it is better than the mini card. It takes only two minutes to complete. To see whether or not this would work, Jean Wu in Hong Kong actually took these screening tests and tried them out in the elderly centers in New Territories, East Region of Hong Kong in China. And she looked at 816 people over the age of 65. She found that 52% were pre-fail and 12% were frail. 
Together, that meant that 64% were either pre-fail or fail. She then asked them to come for a full geriatric assessment and validated the use of these scales in a completed follow-up interview in 255 people, which were 31% of the group. Uh, again, they found that the prevalence of pre-frailty and frailty was 52% and 12.5% respectively. The prevalence for frailty increased with age, going from 5.1% in those aged 65 to 69 years to 16.8% in those greater than 75, and it was more common in women than men, 13.9% to 4.2%. Of those who were pre-frail or frail, 42% 40, uh, uh, had sarcopenia and 60% had mild cognitive impairment, suggesting major overlap between these frequent conditions that we are screening for. Among those who were frail, 63.7% had both sarcopenia and mild cognitive impairment, and only 8.8%. So once we have screened, we need to be able to uh, provide a treatment plan, and the frailty index works very well to do this. So if we look at the frail fatigue, this includes treatment for things such as fatigue syndrome, myalgia encephalitis, anemia, for treatment excess, the examples would be hypotension, chemotherapy, illnesses such as vitamin B12 deficiency, heart failure, renal failure, and cancer. For younger people, Gulf War syndrome, for those who served in Iraq, uh, and had toxin exposures. People who are unhappy with depression often complain of fatigue, and this is a treatable condition. Uh, endocrine diseases such as hypothyroidism, Addison's disease, and diabetes mellitus all cause fatigue, and most importantly, sleep disorders such as sleep apnea, restless legs, and insomnia. People who have a problem with resistance, i.e. climbing one flight of stairs, will need both resistance and balance exercises, take 1,000 international units of vitamin D again, and a protein supplement. For those who have trouble walking one block, aerobic exercises, vitamin D, and protein, again, are the required things to try and improve this and move them away from being frail. People who have more than five illnesses usually have polypharmacy, and pharmacy is an important part of reducing frailty. Uh, the picture here on your uh, left is that of uh, Dr. Gachet holding in his hand the foxglove, which is the precursor for digitalis. And Dr. Gachet was Van Gogh's physician, and he treated Van Gogh for epilepsy with digitalis. It turned out that the digitalis didn't work very well, and eventually Van Gogh got a side effect, which was xanthopsia, or yellow vision, as seen as this painting of the starry night. But in addition to that, each time he had a seizure, uh, Dr. Gachet increased the dose of the digitalis, giving him eventually a second side effect called de of depression, and this led him to uh, committing suicide. On the other side, you see a study we completed at the Veterans Administration where we reduced medicines in people over 10 medicines from 13.1 to 8.2. This led to a reduction in hospitalizations that was highly significant and also a tendency in the reductions. Uh, in people who are losing weight, the Meals and Wheels mnemonic is very useful to pick up reversible causes such as medication side effects, emotional people with depression, one third of older people who lose weight are depressed, alcoholism, anorexia tardive, which is the old age form of anorexia nervosa, and elder abuse. Late life paranoia, I think you're going to be poisoning me and therefore I won't eat, swallowing problems, oral problems, nosocomial infections such as Helicobacter pylori, no money, poverty obviously makes it difficult to buy enough food to eat, wandering and other dementia-related behaviors leads to weight loss. Uh, endocrine disorders are hypothyroidism, hypercalcemia, hyperadrenalism, and diabetes mellitus. Enteric problems, malabsorption, can be seen in older people with gluten enteropathy and or pancreatic insufficiency. Eating problems, people with a tremor often cannot get the food to their mouth appropriately. 
people on therapeutic diets, the low salt, low cholesterol diets, often don't like the taste of the diet, stop eating and lose weight. Shopping and meal preparation problems can obviously lead to a person not eating adequate amount. And then people who develop stones, cholecystitis, can have major weight. Once the diagnosis is made with a screening test, it's important that uh, patients are given information sheets, and these are available for older persons who screen positive for frailty, sarcopenia, or cognitive dysfunction. An example of the frailty information sheet is seen here, an example for the brain health or cognitive dysfunction, and here is an example for the sarcopenia information sheet. It is really important that persons who screen positive for any of these are told to consult their physician as well as following the guidance put out in these information sheets to make sure that diseases that they may have that are occult are diagnosed by them. We will now go on to talk about caregiver stress. This component will be given by Professor Marla Bergweger. Marla. Thank you, Dr. Morley. I'd now like to discuss screening for caregiver well-being. As we know, most of the informal care that is provided to older adults is provided by family members or close friends. In order to better understand the care that they are experiencing and the experience for the care recipient, we really need to make sure that caregiver well-being is assessed on a regular basis by the primary care providers. In looking specifically at caregiver well-being, we've chosen to use the St. Louis University developed caregiver well-being scale, developed by Drs. Susan Tebb, Marla Bergwager, and Doris Rubio, now of the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. The intent of the Caregiver Wellbeing Scale was to provide a clinical assessment tool for practitioners to engage in conversation with pr primarily family caregivers to enable them to develop insight into their own caregiving experience, not only um, how they were coping, but the self-care measures so that they can feel empowered to better provide care for themselves as well as the care recipient. The scale is based on several theoretical perspectives, including those in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, and as I previously mentioned, the strengths-based perspective in which we look for those strengths and resources that are present in the caregiving situation. A brief history of the Caregiver Wellbeing Scale, the original 45-item scale was developed in 1993 by Dr. Susan Tebb. It included two subscales, basic needs, which were including 22 items, and then activities of living for 23 items. In 2012, a 16-item Caregiver Wellbeing Scale was created as a result of the previously validated measure. The shortened scale um, is also validated and includes uh, eight-item subscales, uh, both in the areas of basic needs and activities of living. Most recently, in 2015, the Rapid Caregiver Wellbeing Scale was developed uh, with six items, again retaining the two subscales, three items in each. Here is the Rapid Caregiver Wellbeing Scale uh, in its entirety, and we will provide references at the end of this presentation if you would be interested in seeing either the other two versions. The the caregiver, again, as I mentioned previously, is engaged by the practitioner in a clinical assessment um, in a very conversational way to assess areas of basic needs, which include physical, receiving appropriate health care, which we know from previous work um, by colleagues around the world, the caregivers tend to ignore their own appropriate health care um, needs. Emotional, uh, are, is the caregiver feeling feeling fulfilled by the work that they are doing and caring for the older adult? And how are they feeling about their own financial future? As we know, caregiving, uh, particularly for a spouse or a partner, can uh, be costly and really jeopardize the financial future of the caregiver. In terms of the activities of living, 
uh, we look specifically at self-care because again, research has consistently shown that caregivers have a tendency to ignore their own self-care uh, because they become so focused on caring for the older adult. Consistent with that, the caregiver tends to also ignore their social connectedness in terms of engaging in usual activities uh, with family, friends, uh, work-related activities, volunteer, social and recreational, which is also consistent certainly with time spent for self in terms of rewarding self. As you can see from this slide, uh, the caregiver is asked to comment on each of these six items as they have occurred or not occurred over the past three months and to rate them on a Likert scale from never or almost never to almost always. In terms of the administration, I again would like to emphasize that this really is a conversation with the caregiver that can be visited and revisited numerous times throughout the relationship that the provider has with the caregiver and the care recipient. Because it was designed and intended always to be a clinical assessment tool, there has specifically been no definitive scoring mechanism in developed. And the reason for this is, is that together the caregiver and the provider should have a conversation, have a discussion about how the caregiver feels that he or she is doing. And essentially it's, it's getting a gestalt of the experience. As a provider, you will know very quickly whether or not the caregiver well-being is where the caregiver would like it to be or where you would hope that it could optimally be. The intent also of developing, developing this as a clinical assessment tool is, like with the other assessment screening tools that you've been exposed to in, in this presentation, it's to develop a plan of action for enhancing those areas uh, in which the caregiver may have strengths and resources but aren't, aren't utilizing them, or it could be an area developed for areas in which the caregiver would like to change things about their life. The, um, Caregiver Wellbeing Scale in any of its versions is an excellent tool to be developed, um, to be incorporated into the regular ongoing contacts that the provider has with the caregiver and the care recipient. If you would like to get more information about um, the scales, here are three publications that would be particularly helpful. They provide validation uh, information on each of the versions of the scale. For additional information, please contact either Dr. Tab or myself um, at these, uh, either of our uh, contacts here, and we would be glad to provide copies of the original and shortened caregiver well-being scales and any additional information. Thank you.